Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining in for the fall edition of CFIC's Conference for Inquiry 2021. I'm John Varghese, and as chair of the Communications Committee for the Center for Inquiry Canada, I'm privileged to take on this role of welcoming you all to this event. Welcome back to CFIC's virtual conference, Mind, Brain and Thought. Our next speaker is William B. Davis, aka the X-Files Smoking Man, who will be talking about religion and the actor. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end. We'll be, discuss we'll be collecting questions using the Zoom chat window which you can find at the bottom of your screen, and I'll be presenting the questions to our speaker. Please keep your questions short and to the point. Unfortunately, we may not be able to get to every question, and we may combine questions where appropriate. We have enabled access to the Zoom chat for all participants, and we'll use the Zoom chat to collect questions and also for people to post about technical issues if you have any. As a reminder, for those who prefer more informal discussion, we invite you to join the text chat on Discord, and the link is posted in the chat. In all cases, we expect participants to be respectful of the speakers and also of other audience members. This talk is going to be recorded for publication on our YouTube channel. So if this is a concern for you, please turn off your video and or use a pseudonym. Now about William B. Davis. He began his began his career as a theatre director and trained in England and worked as a director in the British Repertory Theatres, as well as running the Dundee Repertory Theatre. From there, he went to the National Theatre, returning to Canada in 1965, where he became artistic director at the National Theatre School and subsequently artistic director of Festival Lenoxville, later founder of Vancouver's the William Davis Centre for Actor Study. Recent acting includes Continuum, Upload and The Midnight Club. Davis is a longtime member of CFI and has spoken at several skeptic conferences. His first book, Where There's Smoke, was published in 2010. His second book on acting and life will be published in spring of next year. And I'll post a link into the chat for anyone who would like to pre-order. Welcome, William. Thank you. So I'm good to go here? You're good to go. We can oh, hear you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very touched to be here to be with uh, such a group of, uh, of, of experts in their fields, of, uh, in this field of mind, body, and, and uh, mind, rather, mind, thought, and brain. I think I have it in the wrong order, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, how am I, how do I fit into that category? How am I, what do I have to offer? Well, we'll see, I think I have something to offer. Uh, I'm a little, little, um, I'm used to working with Zoom. Uh, I've, I've never spoken with Zoom. I'm an actor and uh, I would much prefer to be strolling up and down the stage and talking to you directly, seeing my audience, hearing you laugh, uh, but we'll do the best we can. I admit that I was a little overwhelmed with the problem of how do I do slides, so I just gave up on that. And uh, Donald Trump doesn't have slides, so I figure I must be okay without slides. He's a good speaker. Um, see, you see, I, did I get a laugh? Who knows? That's it's Zoom. How do we know? Anyway, um, so I have read uh, a lot of the uh, the uh, pillars of this uh, of this uh, movement. Uh, I've read Dawkins, Dennett, Shermer, Pinker. Um, Dawkins' book. Uh, the Selfish Gene, uh, to some extent, changed my life and uh, affects my thinking as an actor. Daniel Dennett, it was listen interesting to hear talk about Daniel Dennett uh, in the last speaker. Uh, I spoke with da Daniel Dennett at a conference once and uh, we had a chat and we sat actually beside each other autographing our books. By the way, I have written an earlier book, so that, that we were ours, I was autographing this book. Um, and he was very pleased to discover that there was a picture of me in People magazine reading his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. So he was quite touched by that. With Dawkins, I had a, a bit of a different experience because Dawkins in the late 90s, he had a, a lecture, a, a Dimbleby lecture, I think it was called, 
in which he made a passionate case for against the X-Files, that the X-Files was just something that basically shouldn't happen. The X-Files was promoting pseudoscience. And that, as he pointed out, every time uh, an idea was presented in the show, and there was a choice between a, an, a rational explanation and a, and, a, and a pseudo explanation, the pseudo one won every time. So therefore, he concluded that uh, the show would encourage people to become pseudo-scientific. So I was on the show at the time. I was a, a rational skeptic. I was an activist. And my mentor, my mentor, Richard Dawkins, was saying I was doing something really bad. So what should I do? So I debated about this. I mean, obviously, if I listened to him, what I should have done is got off the show. I should have just resigned from the show immediately and said, I'll have no more to do with this, this piece of nonsense. Well, as we know, I didn't. I stayed with it. So how did I justify that? Well, the fact of the matter is Dawkins had no evidence for his assertion. He simply believed that if a show like this was presented, it would have this effect. He had no evidence that that was the case. I had actually a little evidence because I had done a number of, um, a number of uh, conventions and I'd asked my audience um, if they believed in these supernatural events. And uh, some of them did, but lots of them didn't. It seemed that there were many skeptics who were fans of the show. So I felt safe to uh, continue with what became a very important part of my career. So, but the other interesting experience, but if you don't know what The X-Files was, I should just explain quickly. It was a, it was a show that promoted the uh, pseudoscience. It was a show that believed that humans had been abducted by aliens, that aliens were among us, that aliens were planning an invasion of the world and so on and so on. And if, if you believe that, I mean, I can sell you a bridge in Brooklyn too. Um, but it was a good story. But what I found when I went to uh, fan conventions is people would assume that because I was in this, I was part of this movement. And they would come up to me and they would say, uh, do you want to come on a skywalk with us? We think we're going to see something tonight. Or um, here's the latest from Area 51. I thought you'd like to know about that. And you know, finally I said, what? well, um, I, I, by the way, I don't, I don't actually believe in any of this. And they said, what do you mean you don't believe in it? I said, no, I said, and the onus is on you to prove that these things exist. It's not on me to prove that they don't exist. At which point they said, oh, but we have proved that they exist. Well, and then I was stumped because to be honest, I didn't know what proof they had presented. Maybe they had presented something worthwhile. And uh, this little situation led me to where I am today, speaking at a skeptic conference at, what, at CS, CFI, CSI, PSYCOP, whichever it is today, um, because it led me to try to find out what in fact the paranormalists were presenting. And that led me to Barry Beierstein, who was a, a, the, the late Barry Beierstein, regrettably, who was an active member of, the, of uh, CFI and, uh, and PSYCOP, which it was called at that time, the Committee for Scientific, Scientific, uh, Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, PSYCOP. And they did studies and very good studies of what people thought they believed in all kinds of paranormal fields. So that gave me the strength to, uh, to go back to these people who said, oh, but we have. Um, the other one on my list, well, the other is on, on my list of uh, people that I've read was Steven Pinker. Uh, Pinker was quite optimistic in one of his books recently about climate change. So I went back to look at his website the other day to see what he thought about climate change now. And I could find no reference whatsoever to climate change. However, 
maybe he's still an optimist. I, I wish I were. Anyway, here we are. Uh, I'm a, an expert on the paranormal. I've even debated with John Mack, who was the Harvard psychologist, uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner even, who completely believed that humans were being abducted by aliens. Um, and how that could be, how that someone that smart could believe that um, may lead us to um, some other issues that affect actor training, which I'll get to in a while. But how do people come to believe some of these remarkable things and particularly things that have to do with memory that's been so-called suppressed? Anyway, what am I an expert on? Why am I here? Well, for what it's worth, I'm an expert on acting. Uh, uh, in my humble opinion, as they say, I am H-O, I have perfect pitch. I can recognize when an actor is true and I can recognize when they're false almost as well as a musician recognizes when a note is flat or false or, or sharp, if they have perfect pitch. Um, why I can do that? Well, that's neither here nor there maybe, but, but it has affected my life. It, it's, it's easier to judge whether an actor is true or not when you see them on stage because there they are, they're vulnerable, they're open, there's no way to disguise what they're doing. They're actually doing it. And if they're real, if it's true, you can see that. Uh, if you're me, at any rate, and if if uh, if they're not, you see that on television, film, it's not necessarily so clear. So you may well think somebody's a very good actor, and they may really not be, or or vice versa. Um, uh, and one remarkable situation once uh, some years ago, I was on a show. And they brought this uh, older actor, older, he was younger than I am now, but never mind, he was an older actor. And they brought him up from Los Angeles to be in this, in this show. And when he first arrived, he was almost in a panic. He said, right to the, um, the, the script supervisor, you've got to help me with the lines. I, I really can't deal with lines anymore. And, and true enough, he couldn't. You know, we rehearsed the scenes and it was always Q, 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 line, 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 line. I thought, how on earth are we ever gonna play this scene? He can't remember a line. Um, subsequently, we did somehow put it together and they edited it together. And I saw it, I saw, saw the show and he was good. I mean, I was watching him, he's so real, he's so focused. But only I knew, not the audience, only I knew he was thinking, what the heck is my next line? But it looked fantastic on film. So anyway, uh, I digress slightly. But what, so, so I'm, I, I will have to, we'll get to what difference religion makes to what an actor does. But if so, if I'm an actor, I'm an actor, I have to play, let's say I play Macbeth. I'm an evil man who kills a king. And I have to be able to say, if it were done when tis done, then for well it were done quickly. If the assassination could travel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success. It's up this, this blow might be the be all and end all here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we'd jump for life to come, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or I'm an actor and I have to play uh, an evil man who smokes a lot of cigarettes and doesn't seem to have a name, and he who aids and abets a, an alien invasion. And I have to say, we give them happiness, they give us authority. Okay, how do I do that? What does an actor do? Non-actors seem to have little idea of what we do as actors. I had a water ski friend and uh, it's funny about my water ski friends, actually. Not only do they not know about acting, they're almost all born again Christians, but that's not, not here nor there either. Um, anyway, he thought that uh, 
I must practice in front of a mirror. I must look in the mirror and practice my, uh, my expressions. Other people think, you know, what we do, we, we memorize the lines and we make some faces. Uh, people ask, you know, how do you learn those lines? I remember an eight, watching an 18 year old play Hamlet and he was lovely. And uh, people were always asking, well, how did you learn the lines? He said, That's the easy part. So anyway, before we get to what the issues are now with the actor and how that affects the brain and what the brain is doing, this, let me do a little brief history of acting, of the craft of acting relatively quickly. So if we start with Shakespeare, Shakespeare, the Shakespearean actor was given a role I mean, literally a role, that's why it's called roles. It was a role on a, some kind of spindle, I guess, uh, on some kind of parchment, I guess. And all it had on it were his text, his lines and his cue line. He didn't see the script for the whole play. And it was a he, of course, obviously it's only me. Um, so, and they didn't rehearse very much. So there he goes, he's, he's just, how did he do it? How did he play a character when he didn't rehearse and he didn't know the whole play? Um, well, he was doing something different than we do to some extent. He was playing verse and the verse would take him where he needed to go largely, I think. Um, and they knew how to do it, which we don't know how to do. Uh, we have to learn how to do it and uh, that's another issue. But it was a different job, really, than what it is now. Then in the 19th century, actors played in great large theaters, and there was literally a formula for each emotion. So I don't know what they were, but if it was horror, it would be <laughs> or if it was fear, <laughs> there would be some particular physical uh, trick or some physical cue, physical behavior that the actor had to present to convey the emotion that the character was supposedly feeling, but probably wasn't. Uh, and the 19th century audience was especially interested in acting. They weren't interested in people, they were interested in actors. And literally, sometimes the uh, upper classes, they would just go to the the lounge or whatever, and they would be told by the usher when to come to sit in their box because then so and so's going to do their big scene. And they'd come and watch so and so do the big scene, and then they'd go back and continue. Um, this is not how we watch theater today. So in the 20th century, then this, this evolved, things changed quite a lot. Um, and with Stanislavski and whatever, there was some kind of intention to be more truthful. The theaters got a little smaller. Uh, there was less need for the big projection. Uh, <clears throat> but still, it's interesting. Uh, I read Laurence Olivier's book on acting. My book on acting, uh, which is the one that's going to come out in the spring, called On Acting. Uh, I do. I spend a lot of time talking about what an actor does and what process they go through. Finally, they arrive at performance and what do they do in performance? That's where Olivier's book starts. It starts with what does he do in performance? What response is he trying to get from his audience? How is he going to play it this moment to get that reaction? How did he play that part to get that? So it's still well, more real and in the 19th century, it still has an, quite an element of theatricality. And then gradually we come to what's come to be called the method. And as Stanislavski's system worked through, especially through the American theater and eventually through the, through the English theater to some degree, the stress has become I am to play a character. 
I am to become someone else. Um, so we see, we see a change in the mid-century. We see newer actors. We see uh, Brando, we see Paul Newman, Albert Finney, Maggie Smith, Judy Dench. We see a different kind of focus. We get an, an old school and a new school. And we used to talk about that all the time. Who's old school, who's new school? And finally, we get to what we might say is the modern actor. What is the modern actor doing? Well, the modern actor thinks that they are playing another person. So there's me, and then there's, let's say, Macbeth. Somehow I have to become Macbeth. Well, how do I do that? Uh, so, you know, I used to say, this is back in the 70s, maybe the 60s. So I'm actor A, and I have to get to character C. So then we would talk about the ABC of acting. What do I have to go through to get from A to C? Well, there were a number of different theories about how to do that. Um, one of which I'm embarrassed to admit was the, was the theory of my acting teacher in 19... 61, I think it was. And the reason I say I'm embarrassed is because he described acting as a marriage, a marriage between the character and the actor. Nothing wrong with that, except that then he said, and you imagine that the character is playing the masculine role in the marriage. wonder what his marriage was like. But anyway, um, so that was just the assumption, you know, that males dominated women. And so if you want to explain how to deal, relate character to an actor, you say that the character is, is the male because he's going to dominate you, the actor. Um, I'm not sure it's a good idea of acting, but it's really not a good idea of living. Um, but we'll... we'll we won't go farther into that. So then what was quite common at the time, now I'm into about 1970, was to talk about neutrality. So if there's an ABC of acting, if I've got to get from A to C, I've got to get rid of me so that I can become them. So how do I do that? I have to become neutral. So then there's all kinds of work with a neutral mask to get rid of all my personal uh, affectations or whatever. There's a whole physical process so that I become a pure human and not an identifiable human so that I can become this other person. And training and uh, acting was so much about becoming that uh, possibility, that neutral possibility that allowed you to flow into that character. And two, uh, two actors you probably know of, uh, quite well known, uh, Donald Sutherland and Brian Cox. I worked with both of them when they were young and both of them went to the same theater school that I went to. Sutherland hated it. He said it, tried to destroy who he was. Brian Cox loved it and went on to years of promoting the school and supporting the school and, and of course doing wonderful work. If you haven't seen Succession lately, you should. He's, he's brilliant. Um, but the two of them had completely diverse, divergent reactions to the experience of that training. So what I now contend is that there are underlying assumptions 
with regard to what humans are and what the process of acting is that has made acting so complicated. So for instance, if I have a soul, here I get to religion, if I have a soul that separates from me when I die, there's two parts of me, there's a soul and there's a body, then obviously the character has a soul that separates from them and has a separate body. How do I do that? How do I get a soul? Uh, okay, I can get rid of that problem by just saying we don't have souls. I think most of the people here would be all right with that. We just don't have souls. We don't have that particular um, uh, look at that problem. But we still think we have a self. And so the other person has a self. Yeah, let me just, uh, just go back to Daniel Dennett for a minute, because we didn't. Um, what I got from Daniel Dennett, when I read Consciousness Explained, was the sense that we don't really have a self in the sense that we think we do. What we really have is a watcher that, you know, he talks about free will and a kind of an extension of the brain activity, and that you don't plug in to an awareness of it till after it started. You know, and there's this kind of famous experiment where they, they uh, ask a, a subject to make a certain choice. And before they, and they have, um, uh, uh, th th things attached to their, to their brain, to their limbs actually, to their hands and whatever, to show what's happening. And so what they see is that the, the hands start to make the choice before the person believes they made the choice. So what does that say about who we are and what we do and what we think we are? And I'll, I'll get to Shermer and I'll get to other, the two different kinds of thinking we seem to think we have as well now, which complicates things as well. But uh, but at any rate, we think we have an essence. We do. We think we have an essence. And we think our character has an essence. So what I have to do as an actor is I have to get from my essence into that essence. Ooh, that's a little challenging. Hmm. <laughs> So why do we think we need to do that? Well, we could go back to Descartes. We could go back to dualism, a sense that we have a separate mind and a separate body. We could take it from McLuhan even. I wish McLuhan had not fallen out of, I don't know, favor or at least attention and focus because what, what happened as we went from the medieval era into the modern era is that humans became separated from their environment, it seemed. Uh, and as we became separate from our environment, we became controlled, we became able to manipulate that world in a way that we didn't when we thought we were part of that world. To take a simple example, if you look at painting in the medieval era, and this has been much criticized because uh, if there was a picture of a cow, the cow was big. It wasn't set in its position uh, behind the barn. It was big and in front of the painting. But we learned in the Renaissance, we learned to paint perspective and we could put the cow in its position as you'd see it in a photograph. But what nobody seems to talk about, except me, is that the medieval artist didn't care. What the medieval artist was interested in was the cow, not the human perspective of the cow, um, which is just an example of how we detached from our perception of the universe. Um, 
And McLuhan has a lot to say about how that may have been affected by the printing press, but I won't, I won't go into that here, but I think it's fascinating. Um, so we're in the modern world. So we have Descartes and dualism, the separation of mind and body. We have Adam Smith and the rational uh, human agency for competition, for furthering our, our uh, personal needs. We have capitalism. And then we have Freud. And with Freud, we have all these subconscious drives uh, mostly sexually derived uh, that we don't know that we have that are manipulating our behavior and the world and that we have our magical dreams that explain who we are and um, Freud did not have a lot of scientific method as many of you may know and has often been dismissed now as a quack but uh, but these big these three influences, I would say, had the strongest influence on what actors think they're doing and what actors feel they have to do. So, so you have to find the essence of the other character. You have to find the objectives that drive the character. And you have to find the underlying pain that's been repressed by the character. You have to access that pain. Oh my. Well, then you can go to the active studio and you can spend a whole lot of money and you can spend years training and learning how to do that. Uh, and then, and then when you get apart, maybe you'll get a scene where you have to cry and boy, you can cry. Oh, and that'll be so exciting. The audience will just be riveted while you cry. Well, I'm sorry if I'm a little skeptical of some of this. <clears throat> but what if, what if that's not what humans are? What if the mind and body are not separate? What if we're not always in competition with others? What if we don't have buried sexual drives that we cannot access? What if the default position of a human is not their separation from other humans, but their identification with other humans? What if there is no original sin? What if the character has no original sin? There's one modern, very successful acting teacher who says that we all know, she says, we all know, that to be an actor, we have to access our individual pain in order to become an actor. Well, I guess we all know it all except me. Uh, 70 years in the business and I didn't know that. I knew some people who had quite happy childhoods and somehow became good actors. I'm not sure how they, they must have been lucky or something. Um, but so what if the character is a lot closer to us than we thought? It seems to me that the modern actor has been struggling because the modern actor is trying to go from nowhere to nowhere, from an essence they don't have to an essence the character doesn't have. So if that's true, and if I'm on the right track, that'd be maybe a lot simpler than the actor's studio makes it. So then what does an actor do? I still have to play this character who kills the king. I still have to play this character who aids and abets an alien invasion. Well, what I do, and actually the method is helpful on this, I don't try to play a character who does this. I try just to do this. I try to do whatever I would need to do to kill a king. I don't actually kill him, I don't have to actually do it. Um, but I have to find out what would make me do it. 
why am I doing it? Why am I different? What, what's pushing me? What, what's, what is the atmosphere that surrounds me? What's the, what are the, um, what are the goals that I have to pursue? Um, so when I play the cigarette smoking man, I didn't think, oh, I must be an evil character. I just did what I thought I had to do. And everybody came up to me afterwards. You're so bad. You're so evil. You're so mean. I said, what? Me? I'm just doing what has to be done. Um, you know, and I used to make people laugh by saying, I thought Mulder was the villain of the piece and not me. But, but, but it, it's the essence of what an actor has to do. An actor has to identify with the action, the behavior, not with some mystical creature. So I don't need to know probably where I went to school. I probably don't need to know a detailed character biography. I just need to know what I need to know to do what I have to do in the film or the play or whatever. So the job becomes narrower and simpler. And then, then there's a few other issues that connect to this because we all think now, I mean, the actor training thinks you always have to have what we call an objective. There's something that you're fighting for because people are always fighting for something. So therefore you have to find out what you're fighting for. But, but maybe people aren't always fighting for something. We're also, we're descended from chip, chimps or, who fight with each other, but we're also descended from bonobos who really get along really well together. So maybe humans aren't always fighting for something. Maybe they're cooperating. Even, even people who, who harp on the objective people harp on Dawkins for looking at the selfish gene and say, see, it proves, it proves that we're in competition because it's the drive of the selfish gene to replicate and that's what, drives humanity. And that may be so. I think it probably is. But how does the gene work? Does the gene always fight other genes? Or does the gene maybe cooperate with some other genes? They get along. And they have children, whatever. I don't know. Um, so the range of behavior has been stereotyped uh, somewhat, I think, in after training. So it's so Shermer talks about, and quite a few people do in one way or another, about two different mental processes that we have. We have the uh, instinctive, intuitive, uh, kind of automatic system that uh, immediately responds to things and does things quickly, and and a more rational, uh, more controlled, more analytical part of our mind. And I forget what he what he calls it, but there seems to be this differentiation. And an actor, of course, wants to be spontaneous and free and have it re releasing all those things. But the trouble with the actor is he has to release all those things and want to say, want to do whatever he feels like. And what he feels like doing is saying, if it were done when it's done, then it were well, it were done quickly, which is a little complicated. So, so somehow the the rational part of the brain has to analyze and decode and position the actors so that they can release uh, and do what they want. One of the things I say in my book is, is when we were kids, we always had one day of the year in the summer where we could do what we wanted. It was a, the day we could do whatever we liked. And we looked forward to that day all summer. Um, and it was wonderful. And as my mother never tired of telling her friends, we pretty much did everything we did any other day. But it just felt different. It felt like we were doing what we wanted to do. And really that's what an actor wants to get to. An actor wants to get to the place where they're doing what they want to do. Not because the writer wrote it, not because the director told them, uh, but because it's what you 
you want to do. So that's all, that's the work that an actor has to do with the rational brain to get to the uh, free moving uh, or, or spontaneous part of the, of the organism. Two other, two other aspects, and then I'll, I'll wind it up for questions, but um, one of just on brain, and again, to you, many of you know much more than I on this, but um, that when things become habit, they move to a different part of the brain, according to what I've read about brain imaging. And the habit, oddly enough, is a great trap for the actor. Because you want, as an actor, you want to have the, the moment of spontaneous action. You want it to be alive as you, the viewer or audience, see it happen. What you don't want is an echo of the action because you've done it before. Then all of a sudden, the same action has no life. It's flat. Um, and it's, it can be a really simple thing. Um, I remember doing a play once where for some reason in rehearsal, I'd figured out a reason to go to the fireplace. I don't know there was a drink or it was cold. I don't remember what the reason was, but there was a reason that motivated me to go to the fireplace. And I realized partway through the run of the play, I'm going to the fireplace because this is where I go to the fireplace. That it had no reason other than that's what I always do at this point in the play. And that's not life, that's habit. There was a play, there was a production of the Three Sisters done by the Manitoba Theater Center, which I saw well into its run. And frankly, I was bored to tears, I could hardly stay away. Years later, I talked to someone else who had seen a preview of that same production and said it was wonderful, it was dynamic. So now it's possible. She didn't have my perfect pitch <laughs> and it was all wrong. Um, but more likely is we were both right, that it was fantastic. And all those things were happening. When I saw it, all those things were being echoed. Plato in his cave, we were seeing it from outside, images from the outside. Um, and an actor has to fight that, and actors often don't. Actors often think, oh, it's cute to make jokes on other actors up when they're facing upstage because they can do it all in, in their sleep. Well, that's too bad. I mean, it's not very interesting for the audience if you can do it in your sleep. And so one final point, and then I'll close for questions, um, that has really been an issue for actor and actor training. And curiously enough, I have an inside look at that through being involved with alien abduction. And that is repressed memory. We believed, or there was a time in the 80s, that's particularly, where, where people really believed that terrible things had happened and people had repressed that memory and didn't know that they'd happened. And only through therapy could they come to discover that they'd happened. And my suggestion to John Mack is that what was happening is the therapist was really through leading questions suggesting that the whatever it was an alien abduction or a uh, se sexual abuse had happened when they had not and uh, some of you may know hundreds and hundreds of people men went to jail because their victims had recovered this memory of a sexual abuse that had not happened. And finally, it took Elizabeth Loftus and others to demonstrate how that happens. And, and eventually all those men hopefully were released from jail. Um, 
but it's still a common kind of Freudian uh, expectation. Uh, Wilhelm, I didn't mention Wilhelm Reich on my way through Freud, but Wilhelm Reich was an influence to all of us because of his concept of character armor. And we thought as actors training, we had to get rid of the character armor that was suppressing our uh, repressed sexual childhood, basically. Um, so that my shoulder, which was always up like this, and I had to work to relax it, was there because I was repressing something or other. It wasn't just because I always carried my briefcase with that shoulder, which was true. Anyway, so, but what's happened in actor training is the belief that, that in order to relax the body and the voice, you have to unearth these repressed sexual or traumatic events, which probably never happen. Um, and probably you don't need to. Um, so a simple, I have a simple piece of advice to a prospective acting student. If you say, you wanna to go to a voice teacher and they say, well, make sure you bring a box of tissues with you, I would say, look for a different voice teacher. Um, and there's more history to that in voice training than I could go on. But I had, during that period, you know, I had actors come to me from a voice class saying, I think I've been said, I think I was sexually abused when I was a child. I had others that were, others were traumatized. Um, so that's another function of the brain. We have to be careful of. So that's my story for now. Uh, I could answer questions. Okay, so we um, we have a few questions that have uh, come into the chat, and if you have any other questions, um, please please post them and um, make sure to post them on on the Zoom chat, um, not on the Discord chat, because we we aren't uh, uh, monitoring the Discord chat four questions. So uh, the, the first question I have is, um, were there some roles which you added unique personal features to the character you were playing, knowing that it would widen or improve the dimension of that character? No. <laughs> um, um, not directly, not directly, because to do it directly would be to be manipulative. Um, to say, um, what, would, what would you say? Um, I don't know what to say. I have 10 shoulders, so therefore I'm going to play the character with 10 shoulders. So I'll add this personal characteristic to the character. Um, but no, my approach would be more to work from what, what I think the character is doing, but doing it the way I would do it if I did it, even though I wouldn't do it. Um, so in that way, some of my personal characteristics might, might certainly reveal themselves, but I wouldn't do it as a conscious decision saying, oh, let's use that personal characteristic. Thank you. Um, a question that um, I, I have got the impression that actors are quite a superstitious lot sometimes. I mean, for example, the prohibition uh, against mentioning the play Macbeth, which I noticed that you uh, mentioned several times, and I'm not sure if that was intentional. Um, but I'm wondering if you've had any notab notable experiences where that was an issue. Well, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, it, it is extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the number of actors who believe that this theater is haunted, um, any particular theater, uh, it is bizarre, you know. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think there's a lot of superstition. Um, some of it is well founded. Um, there is one superstition, uh, which it, no, it's not well founded. I lie. Um, there's one superstition which is that you should never say the last line of a play, the curtain line of a play, until you ring the curtain up. So I was doing a pantomime in, in directing a pantomime in, in Britain and the actor playing the principal boy would not say the last line in rehearsal. And uh, sure enough, when the curtain went up and it was time to say the last line, he made a mess of it. 
because he never said it. Um, so that wasn't a very good. Um, but some of the, yeah, it's funny. We have we all have funny little ones, but uh, uh, the one I hate, um, the, 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 which I suppose is a superstition, is is never to clap at the curtain call during rehearsal because they, you know, you rehearse the curtain call and then all the techies want to clap. And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't, no. Uh, but I'm being just as stupid as everybody else. It doesn't make the slightest bit of difference. And, and the theater is not haunted. And, but yeah, I've had theater people say, you don't believe in ghosts? Oh my God, no. But uh, David Duchovny, uh, who played Mulder on the x Files played the character who always wanted to believe, doesn't believe. He's a skeptic. Thanks, and that, that brings us to another one of our questions. Uh, um, um, so, you know, do, why do people think that uh, because of a role somebody plays, that's what they believe? And so you've answered the question about David Duchovny. What, what about uh, Gillian Anderson? Um, yeah, <laughs> she was the, she was on the other side, apparently. She, she believed a lot of that stuff. And uh, so, you know, curiously, they were on the opposite side of the, of, of the fight in the actual show. Um, Interesting. David's better educated. <gasps> Maybe I shouldn't say that, but he's, he's very well educated. David's very smart, by the way. And uh, if you haven't read in, any of his recent novels, I recommend it. Oh, thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, um, one of the first steps for actors to understand and play their characters is to reach a passive clean slate state, letting go of their own habits. Can you recommend an effective technique or exercise that would help with that? Just read that back to me again. You've mentioned that one of the first steps for actors to understand and play their characters is to reach a passive slash clean slate state, letting go of their own habits and impulses, etc. I think I've not made myself clear. I've said that was something we used to think we had to do, but I no longer think we have to do that. You don't have to go to neutral. You don't have to go. There isn't, you don't have to go to B to get from A to C because you don't have to go to C. You're just gonna start with A. You're just gonna start from yourself and do what the character does. You, whatever the character does, you do it. You do it the way you would do it if you did it, even though you wouldn't do it. And you will become the character. So no, you, you don't have to go to okay. this blank, clear slate in the middle. I don't Thank you for that. clarifying that. Uh, do you have any comments about the um, UFO footage recently released by the Pentagon? <laughs> I bet you're getting that question a lot. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I've read CFI's response <laughs> to it, and uh, there are some un unidentified happenings, but the uh, chances that any of them have anything to do with aliens is minusculely remote. Okay. Might make for another good series. <laughs> well, um, I think uh, that's all the questions. We had a, um, a, an, an interesting uh, comment, like uh, um, we're all clapping silently in, in thanks uh, for your talk. Um, and uh, so for, for those of you who would like to uh, um, clap with a little bit more, um, if you if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you can see a reactions tab and there's a clap icon. So you can do that. Uh, and uh, you know what? Oh, we've got to, um, well, actually one one question just popped up, so I won't let you go yet. Um, okay. Can you explain how, when Mulder uncovered a rail car of dead aliens, it didn't stink? <laughs> ah, yeah, no, I can't. Um, uh, I can't explain that. Um, uh, there are many mysteries in the show, but 
um, maybe aliens don't stink. We don't know what they're made of. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. that's good. Yeah, I, I, I know that what I did with that is my character. I had them burn it. So maybe I did notice that it stank. I, didn't. I burned it with Mulder inside, as I recall. Um, thank you very much. And um, I have posted again, um, for people who want to know more, the, uh, um, the link to, uh, to pre-order the book 